This is Duke University. I know we're in here a little bit tight, but uh, it's gratifying that others are as excited about the conference as we are. And we're particularly excited about you all coming and, and finding that the agenda was uh, of interest to you. We have lots of things to do today, and I'm going to try to minimize the number of administrative announcements, but I really do want you to know how much we appreciate your coming. <clears throat> I think we're going to have um, some terrific speakers and our, and our first panels so are already up here ready to go, but there's a few administrative announcements I want to talk about. Parking, I think those of, there's the parking lot, I understand, is, is filling up rather rapidly, but I think there's still a few places. On Saturday, it'll be completely different, and I'll tell you uh, how that'll work. You'll have free parking on Saturday right here in the law school lot. Wi-Fi, for those of you who have brought your computers, you can get a card at the registration desk that will explain to you how you can log on and uh, follow that way. Phones, please, uh, we all, oops. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> so some of you might be in the same situation, so please, if you can, turn your phones to vibrate or off completely. Breaks, uh, the restrooms are kind of towards your left as you go out. And I would ask you to be as quiet as you can during the breaks because on, at least today, because we do still have classes going on. And our students are approaching exams and uh, so they're, they're in a little bit, shall we say, high stress mode. Um, the, we are filming the uh, conference and I want to, and I'll remind you of this again, if you ask a question, uh, it will be recorded. I do ask you to identify yourself and actually ask a question. I'll talk about that more in a minute. Uh, I just want to say this. Uh, I've asked a lot of speakers, a lot of them are from government. Uh, they really need to, you, please understand that I've asked them to give their personal opinions and they're not necessarily reflecting their institutions or their governments or their militaries. And I think we have a better conference that way. If, if you simply want the press release, we could, we could mail that to you. But I want to get the dynamics, especially during the, the Q&A portion. Uh, CLE. Those of you, the conference has been approved for 10 hours of CLE, plus an hour of ethics. And I strategically placed the ethics hour at the very last presentation of the conference on Saturday afternoon, just as a help, help you with your motivation, sort of. Uh, and I think, I think it's going to be fun, because we, we haven't really done that before. And I think you might find some of the issues we're going to be talking about uh, hopefully intriguing. But here's the deal. We know what it's approved for North Carolina. You can probably, with the documents that you can get at the CLE uh, station on the registration desk, you can probably get approved in your state. I got approved last year in Pennsylvania. So we have the constituent documents, but really we don't know what's required for every single state. So we'll give you the documents. And if there's something later on that you need, just email me. Like if you need the, the speakers list or, or some other documentation, we'll do our best to get it to you. But it's very important that you sign in if you want CLE credit. q and I, I kind of mentioned this before. We really do want, and we set aside a considerable amount of time for each, we've asked each panel to set aside a considerable amount of time for q and I'm hoping that we actually get questions. Those of you who are experienced with uh, conferences, sometimes you get dissertations and, and things like that. That's not all bad. It's just not for this part of the conference. And what I would ask you to do is if you do have that, that kind of feedback or whatever, engage the speakers and the panelists during the, the breaks. And we, we've put a number of breaks into the schedule because we know how much that is, how important that is. Along that line, one of the reasons we have a conference where people actually come in as opposed to just doing a webcast or something like that is because I'm hoping that you take advantage of the breaks to get to know other people in this national security community. 
In other words, don't be afraid during the breaks just to walk up and introduce yourself to other people. That's a big <laughs> purpose of it. We have a number of young members of the armed forces here. Some of them are in uniform, some of them are in, in uh, mufti, so to speak. Uh, and I really want to see this dialogue going back between the academy, uh, interested people on the outside, and members of the armed forces. So I, I would really hope that that would occur. Panelist biographies. We have a really all-star team of panelists, uh, beginning with uh, we have our, our, guest spe our luncheon speakers, uh, Mr. Will Gunn from the Veterans Administration, and my good friend, Mac Owens, and I'm going to be talking a little bit about them when we come up, when those events come up. But the, we're trying to be green. People who know me are surprised to hear that, but I actually am <laughs> trying to be green, and instead of sentencing some poor innocent tree to death to reproduce the biographies that oftentimes you leave a conference and it's just more work for people to clean up. They're posted on outside, and it's also, if you go online, they're posted online. So, and also we're gonna be doing a little intro, so I think you'll, you'll get a good feel of who our terrific uh, panelists and speakers are. Feedback. You know, um, we thought about this, and we're not gonna do a feedback form, but I want your feedback. And I want it to come directly to me. And it, even like now, if you're online now, you don't like something, please send me an email right now so we can fix it ongoing during the conference. I'm going to come back to this at the end of the conference because what I'm going to ask you, what your task, what your, your take home homework is going to be from the conference is give us ideas for next year's conference. So we really do want your feedback. And like I say, don't hesitate to give me that in real time. Our conference team, uh, you know, I, I, can't, I can't think about anything and, until we recognize Scott Selman, our Director Emeritus. Scott built the center uh, with Robbie Everett, and he ran these conferences for many years, and believe me, he left my tiny feet very, very big shoes to fill. Uh, those of you who, uh, I'm sure you, you at least talked to Kathy and Fred at some point over the phone or exchanged emails, uh, absolutely my right and left hand. Our events team. Laura, if Laura knew this was up here, she'd have a conniption because <laughs> she likes to be, Laura and Kamisha like to be behind the scenes. But they have, a, to run events at Duke Law School is, shall we say, a challenging matter because there's, there's other events going on today and so forth, and they've just really been terrific. Our media team. You know, we sat down early on. We did our media a little bit differently this year. We really converted to email, but uh, Melinda is the one who designed our wonderful poster, which I really, really like, and I think has been a great attention getter. And Forrest has worked with the, with the other media. And our tech team. You don't often hear about the tech team, but they are recording the conference. They're, they've assisted us with the... Uh, the setup of the PowerPoint and so forth. I had a little heart attack here right before we started where the screen wasn't there and so forth, but they fixed it. And uh, this is the heart and soul. And I know, I know what Courtney's thinking right now, and you can, she's almost as red as the sweater of the person she's sitting next to. <laughs> but you know, they really are trip. And on top of everything else, you know, I'm kind of new to Duke. The staff around here is just really great because they, they're always, and they know I'm a new guy, so they're always reaching out and trying to make things better. Our volunteers. You've seen the, the wonderful young men and women who have directed you. They have little blue, blue dots, I think, on their uh, name tag. They're our student volunteers. And really, what, that's another thing I'm hoping you have a chance to be exposed to here. One of the things I really like about Duke is the students because they are really engaged. They're not, I haven't suffered it anyway. They're not focused on grades. They really want to learn the material. They're super smart and they're normal human beings, which is a little bit unusual for law students, <laughs> those of you who, who may be familiar. Uh, and, our, and our board, this is the, the lens board and these are people who, who take their own time to give us guidance, give us support, give us ideas, and so forth. 
and our benefactors, supporters, and contributors. Uh, as many of you know, uh, the Kathleen R. Everett uh, Charitable Trust is one of the, the, key, the key benefactor for the Lens Center, and they have been very, very generous to us, and we, we wouldn't be here but for their, the generosity of that trust. And our supporters, the program in public law, they, have re they really stepped up and gave us a lot of support. In addition, you'll see Neil Siegel, he, he's serving on one of the panels. And for the Duke Law students, student affairs is, are the ones who are paying for your dinner tonight at the Washington Duke. They've stepped, because they realize this is a great opportunity not just to hear General Hayden, the former director of the CIA, but also hopefully to network with the experts and, and people who have come to our conference. And of course, our contributors. I didn't ask their permission for this, but what the heck, you know, I'm a former general, I just kind of do what I want. And, uh, but we really, really do appreciate that. Any questions before we get started? And I want you to know, I've hit my time on target almost exactly for the military people. I'm a, in fact, I'm a little bit ahead of schedule. But any questions that I can answer now? Let's, um, let's dive right into the panel. And I'd like to introduce uh, our moderator, and he'll do a little introduction of his fellow panelists. Joseph Bloker is a really interesting guy. You know, uh, number one, he's one of the, the most popular professors uh, in the school. I was asking some students one time, uh, you know, what professors do you like? And his name comes up very frequently. In fact, one person said, you know, Professor Plug, he is the best professor. I, I'm, gosh, I wish I could take more courses. And I said to the student, you know, I'm here. <laughs> I'm, I'm hearing that. that. That inner voice was audible. You know? No, really. And the other interesting thing, when we started putting together this conference, okay, I wanted to engage the, the Duke faculty. Joseph, I went went in and I had this big sales pitch about how this would be good. I hardly got a word out of my mouth. He says, Charlie, great, I, of course I want to do it. Oh, you want me to moderate? Yeah, can I, you want me to put it, what can I do? What can I? That's the kind of attitude that makes the, the whole difference. And he was the first, you know, first victim <laughs> on the faculty um, to help me. And then it went down to Madeline's office and, and you'll, and got the same warm reception. And so you'll, you'll see that, I think, out of the faculty that you'll see on the panels. But let me tell you a little bit about Joe, and then I'll shut up and, and the real experts can start talking about. Joe is a professor of law here at uh, Joseph is a professor of law here at Duke. Uh, his academic interests include constitutional law, the First and Second Amendment, capital punishment, property, federal courts, law and development. Yikes. You know. And listen to his, he's clerk for two different circuit judges. He's a magnum cum laude and Phi Beta Kappa from Rice University. He was a Fulbright Scholar to Ghana. He was a Gates Scholar to Cambridge. He has a master's in philosophy and land economy, and his JD is from Yale Law School. Joseph, you know, there's a lot of reasons to hate you. <laughs> <laughs> to be perfectly candid. But um, without further ado. Uh, well, thank you very much, Charlie, for that, uh, that warm, uh, warm introduction. Um, and thanks also um, to Scott, uh, to, to Kathy, to Fred, um, to the student volunteers who, who put this all together. Thanks also to the dean um, for his support of, the, of, of this conference. Uh, my name is Joseph. I teach constitutional law uh, here at the law school. Um, and it is my uh, privilege to introduce the first panel today, uh, which is inter International Human Rights Law. Lessons Learned and Challenges for the Future. We have three fantastic scholars uh, join us here today um, with diverse uh, and distinct and interesting and important approaches to the topic, all of them with uh, diverse uh, experience in government uh, as well. I'll introduce them. Uh, they will give comments, and then we'll have um, a question and answer period. And, and just to emphasize what Charlie said, we'd really love to hear uh, a lot of questions and comments from the audience. So we will leave plenty of time for that. And uh, as Charlie did, we will try to hit the, uh, hit the, uh, uh, hit the timing mark uh, as well. Um, the first speaker is Andrew Woods. Uh, Andrew is a Clemenko Fellow and lecturer on law at Harvard Law School. His research interests include international human rights, 
international criminal law and criminal law uh, with a particular focus on interdisciplinary approaches to law and policy. His dissertation uh, explores a behavioral approach to the institutional structures of the international human rights regime, and he is currently co-teaching a course on corporate responsibility uh, and human rights with Professor Jack Goldsmith of Harvard Law School. Uh, second, we'll hear from Sarah Mohammed, uh, who's an assistant professor of law at Berkeley. Uh, her primary interests are in the areas of international, uh, international law, human rights, and international criminal law. Her research focuses on the function of international law in situations of violent conflict and atrocity. Uh, she has extensive experience in government. Uh, she served as a senior advisor in the Office of the U.S. Special Envoy for Sudan and as an attorney advisor for human rights and refugees in the State Department's uh, Office of the Legal Advisor. She also represented the United States in negotiations of the Third Committee of the United Nations General Assembly and received the State Department's Superior Honor Award for her participation in drafting a U.N. resolution condemning the use of rape as an instrument to achieve political objectives. Finally, we'll hear from Duke's own Madeline Morris. Um, uh, Madeline's an expert in counterterrorism law and policy, international criminal law, the law of war, transnational jurisdiction, and public international law. She has served as a member of the United States uh, Secretary of State's Advisory Committee on International Law, Advisor on Justice to the Pre President of Rwanda, Special Consultant to the U.S. Secretary of the Army, Senior Legal Counsel, Office of the Prosecutor for the Special Court of Sierra Leone, Advisor to the special, uh, special Prosecutor of the Republic of Serbia, expert witness on the Alien Towards Claims Act, and is a witness before the United States Senate Committee on Foreign Relations. In 2005, she founded the Guantanamo Defense Clinic uh, here at law school, which she directs. Uh, she has written extensively on issues pertaining to the detention and trial of suspected terrorists. So with that, I'll turn it over. Um, each of the panelists will offer comments, and at the end, I'll uh, moderate questions. Look forward to hearing them. Andrew. <coughs> Thanks, Joseph. Um, and thanks, Charlie, for organizing the conference. Can I call you Charlie? <laughs> <laughs> Mr. General. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Mr. General. Uh, thanks for, all, for being here so bright and early. Um, I, I, this shouldn't be too tedious. I'm going to try to tell a couple of stories. Um, so my, first, let me just tell you a little bit about what I do, and then I'll tell the stories. Um, so my work generally is focused on how behavioral insights Social psychological insights, behavioral economics insights might inform or cause us to rethink the design of regulatory systems. So another way of putting this is that I'm interested in regulatory systems where instead of simply prohibiting X, we prohibit Y to prohibit X, or we try to design the situations such that X is less likely. Um, I've been interested mostly in those kinds of regulatory approaches in the human rights context. But what I want to talk about today is whether there are lessons from counterinsurgency of that sort that might apply to human rights. Um, so I'll tell two stories that I think uh, flesh that out a little bit. The first uh, comes from Afghanistan. I was talking to a friend recently. One is from Afghanistan and one is from Iraq. I was talking to a friend recently who had spent some time in Afghanistan doing report writing for Human Rights Watch. He was a freelancer. He wasn't a full-time worker for, uh, for Human Rights Watch. And he described the process of producing a report for the NGO about the killing of civilians in the battlefield in Afghanistan. So the report was about targeting practices, and they were concerned with civilian deaths produced by rockets sh shot by coalition forces and also by roadside bombs placed by the Taliban. And if any of you know the Human Rights Watch report methodology, these things can be kind of tedious. They're highly fact-intensive. They generally go around and ask, look into allegations of abuse or, or um, indiscriminate killings. And then they try to document, find out what's true, what's not true. And then they, once they've got a stack of facts that they think are relatively certainly true, they match them up with international law. So they come out with a conclusion that says there were three violations of human, human rights law and seven violations of the laws of war. Uh, and then they typically deliver these reports to the, to the parties concerned. It's worth noting, I guess, that this is, the, this is now the gold standard Human Rights Watch reporting style for, uh, for human rights methodologies. If you end up taking a class in any of Duke's human rights clinics, you would at some point be exposed to this human rights fact-finding and report writing me uh, mechanism. So they delivered this report to the coalition forces, went through the official grievance mechanism, met several times with different members of the coalition forces who, who agreed to look into the allegations of abuse uh, and also tried to explain their targeting practices. Um, Human Rights Watch was happy to at least have an audience to discuss 
improving targeting along some human rights or laws of war dimension. When they sent the report to the Taliban, there was no response. And my friend, who had not been a member of Human Rights Watch for long, was surprised that no one at Human Rights Watch was surprised or seemed to care. They didn't expect a response from the Taliban. There's no official grievance mechanism, right? That's, that's where the inquiry stopped for the organization. But my friend said, why, why stop there? And this is why I'm telling the story. What he did next is considered kind of radical in human rights circles, and he described it as a counterinsurgency strategy. In the process of producing the report, they had interviewed families who had lost family members due to roadside bombs. He said, I've got this stack of audio tapes on my computer. Why don't we burn them to a CD and mail them to radio stations all over Afghanistan and see if anybody will play them? He convinced his um, superior, who was uh, skeptical, and in fact, one radio station agreed to play the tapes. Played the tapes for two nights, and after the second night of hearing parents describe the loss of their child, the phone rings in the human rights office in Kabul. It's the Taliban who want to meet for the first time in the six years that Human Rights Watch has been in Afghanistan. Now, I tell that story. That story there, there are a couple of things to draw from that story. Um, the most obvious point is that you've got to know your audience, right? That's a relatively straightforward point. It's a core piece of counterinsurgency strategy as I understand it. But it's a point that bears mentioning in the human rights context. Because it's not a surprise if you, if you know anything about human rights reporting or the state of human rights rule enforcement and monitoring mechanisms, you wouldn't be surprised to hear that the human rights group is really good at getting an audience with a Western government and not so good at getting an audience elsewhere. Um, and so I'm, the, to the extent that counterinsurgency teaches us something about getting an audience elsewhere, I'm hopeful that there are lessons to apply in the human rights context. The second story comes from Iraq, and this is a story that, um, that comes out of my own experience in Iraq. So I was interested in this idea a couple of years ago that counterinsurgency either had some synchronicity with human rights goals uh, or, or that lessons could be learned from counterinsurgency, whether they were human rights lessons or simply general lessons for strategy and policy making that might be portable to other domains. I found out about a guy called Major General Douglas Stone, who I'm sure some of you are aware of. I'll just tell you a little bit about his background because his story is so interesting. I was interested to spend time with him independent of the work that he was doing along a human rights dimension. Stone had received standard military training and then at a pretty young age decided the military wasn't for him. He's from California and he decided he was going to go into private practice. He found a job working as the assistant to a guy called Dave Packard who was starting a new technology company in the 60s, now known as Hewlett Packard. Stone made a lot of money, started a bunch of companies, all the while, though, keeping up his reservist status. And, it, and by the time of the Abu Ghraib scandal, was the highest ranked reservist in the armed forces and was brought in to head up Task Force 134 detainee operations. Stone is a pretty hard-headed guy who cares about the bottom line. And as far as I could tell, so one of the first things he did when he got to Iraq to clean up detention operations was to institute a number of reforms that looked like pro-human rights, pro-humanitarian law reforms. Stone didn't seem like, to me, the kind of guy who would care about those reforms. And he said he was doing it to win the war. That struck me as kind of interesting. So I asked him if I could spend a month trailing him in Iraq. Uh, and to my surprise, he said yes. So within a day, I was on a plane to Kuwait to catch a plane to Baghdad uh, and spend some time with, with Stone. Uh, I followed him down to Camp Bukha, where at the time, 21,000 detainees were being held. That was kind of shocking to me at the time. There was a lot of attention to Guantanamo. I'm sure everyone in the room has heard of Guantanamo, and I'm guessing not everyone in the room has heard of Camp Bukha. There were, at the time, a, a couple of hundred people being held at Guantanamo, and Camp Bukha was the largest prison in the world. Um, Stone, as we're walking around this massive, it's really a town, and he was the mayor, I think, in some ways, of this town, we're walking, he's chatting and telling me about the new policies that he's implemented in the, in the detention facility. And at one point I look to my side and he's not, he's not there anymore. And I look back and he's, on, he's reaching down in this dusty, dirty gravel lot. He's reaching down to pick up a piece of chewing gum that someone had spit out. And he ran up to me and, and held it in his hand and he said, if I find that one hair of my soldiers is out of place, I know abuse is not far behind. Now I didn't... There were a number of other things on that trip that suggested to me that he really believes that. 
I didn't have a chance to investigate the facilities. I'm not claiming that Stone eliminated all abuse. But the best reviews of his policies do suggest there was a reduction in, in rights violations after his, um, after his tenure. At, more importantly, whether there was one or not, a reduction in rights abuses, this seems like an interesting strategy for, um, for investigation. Whether this, this claim that all rule violations need to be taken seriously, that something like a zero tolerance approach is going to be relevant or could be relevant to eliminating law of war violations. Um, and in fact, there are other examples uh, that suggest that that, that 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 approach may actually bear some fruit. So last year, the um, Red Cross released a study that's kind of fascinating. I'm surprised it hasn't received more attention. It's one of the only studies of its kind. They asked combatants who had been involved in war crimes violations of a huge range for long, they sat down and had these long interviews and asked them why they thought they engaged in these war crimes. And to their surprise, it wasn't the case that the best predictor of where you were likely to see war crimes was something like the 24 scenario, where there's strategic information to be gained, or the ethnic tension scenario, where war crimes are committed because the captor and the captee come from different groups. They, at the end of the study, these authors suggest that the best indicator of where you're likely to see war crimes is where there's been a general breakdown in the command structure. And they suggest actually not looking to see whether soldiers uh, have personal commitments to international laws of war, whatever that means, but instead, whether the soldiers' barracks are clean and their uniforms are pressed. So what I find interesting about that, and there, there's a, that's, that's only a correlation, right? That's not necessarily a causal story. We don't know if that claim is right, and we still don't know that, but if that claim is right, it's not clear that we know the mechanism through which the pressed uniforms has an effect on the likelihood of abuse down the line, right? It may just be a correlation because there are other things that, that guide both the likelihood of oppressed uniform and the likelihood of abuse. Um, but, but in a world of limited resources to outside monitors, having better information about indicators of abuse is hugely valuable. So just from a cost-benefit res uh, resource allocation point of view, that correlation could be hugely useful. I think stepping back at a slightly higher level of generality, there's also a very important lesson here, a lesson that's been applied in other regulatory contexts, which is that sometimes the, it's much more important to worry about whether an individual has a disposition towards rule breaking and instead to ask whether a particular situation is disposed towards creating rule violations. And I think that is a core counterinsurgency lesson that hasn't been applied much in the international human rights context. And I'm hopeful that it, that it can be. And I'm hopeful to hear from the speakers in the coming uh, days throughout the conference to see if, that, if there are any more examples of that kind of situation where, uh, that kind of lesson where, the, where, the, where, the, where we learn that the most relevant unit of analysis sometimes is the, are the features of a particular si situation rather than the dispositions of the actors involved in that situation. Thanks. Thank you, and thank you, Joseph. Uh, and uh, thanks so much to the organizers of the conference for having me here. It's really a pleasure to be part of this uh, fantastic discussion. Um, so I'm going to focus on uh, the question of how the war in Afghanistan helps us to understand humanitarian intervention. So by humanitarian intervention, I mean a use of force that's undertaken by a state or a group of states to protect human rights uh, uh, abuses or to protect against human rights abuses or stop them in another state. Now this might seem like a surprising choice of topic for this conference. The war in Afghanistan was, of course, framed by the US government as an exercise of self-defense, not as a humanitarian intervention. Indeed, the September 11th attacks and the subsequent war in Afghanistan sparked some fears that the war on terrorism would end the so-called human rights era. In February 2002, writing in the New York Times, Michael Ignatieff wrote, the question after September 11th is whether the era of human rights has come and gone. Now, this question made a lot of sense at the time. In the face of the murder of thousands of people on American territory, how could leaders expend manpower, firepower, or even attention on faraway humanitarian crises? 
The war in Afghanistan, however, is a critical point of analysis for humanitarian intervention because it offers some insights on the intersection of security interests and humanitarian rationales for intervention. Now, the September 11th attacks were, of course, treated in many fora as military attacks. The UN Security Council passed a resolution immediately condemning the attacks as an, uh, a threat to international peace and security. NATO invoked uh, the collective self-defense provisions in Article 5 of the Washington Treaty for the first time. The Congressional Authorization for the Use of Military Force directed that force to those who planned, authorized, committed, or aided the attacks or who harbored those actors. So this was not about the people of Afghanistan. It was about the people of the United States or about any other people who might fall victim to terrorist attacks, defending them or avenging their loss. But very quickly, this changed. A few weeks after the attacks, the United States delivered a letter to the UN Security Council informing it that the, UN, that the United States was exercising its right of self-defense in initiating military action against Afghanistan. The letter focused on establishing that Al-Qaeda was supported by the Taliban and was responsible for the September 11th attacks, and it focused on explaining the US intent to target military establishments and terrorist training camps. At the end of the letter, though, um, the United States added, the United States will continue its humanitarian efforts to alleviate the suffering of the people of Afghanistan. Now, this was the first time the people of Afghanistan really met, were mentioned as a central focus of the United States in these early days. But very soon, we saw a shift toward greater emphasis on humanitarian aspects of the campaign. So first, there was an emphasis on humanitarian aid. Six weeks after that letter, Deputy Ass Assistant Secretary of Defense Joseph Collins said humanitarian assistance is an integral part of the military strategy. In January 2002, Andrew Natsios, then head of USAID, said that defeat of the Taliban made it possible for humanitarian interventions to succeed. After that, nation building then came to the forefront and it has been a goal of the war in Afghanistan ever since. As the war evolved from its initial retributive and defensive posture, human rights became not only a goal of the intervention, but also a justification for it. The Taliban's mistreatment of the Afghan people was presented as the real evil against which the United States was fighting. So in explaining why the, UN, the United States was in Afghanistan, the answer wasn't only about punishing the Taliban or about finding Osama bin Laden dead or alive. Instead, it was about standing for human dignity, for the rule of law, for the rights of women, for free speech, for religious tolerance. Now, human rights were, of course, in crisis in Afghanistan long before the attacks on the United States. Afghanistan was a classic failed state. It was a government in collapse. There were massive violations of human rights law, of international law. Private militias and factions had control over violence there. The Clinton administration had used coercive pressure through sanctions to try to induce Kabul to stop supporting al-Qaeda. They had provided humanitarian aid. But these were afterthoughts, side points, much more than they were focal points of American foreign policy. What made the human rights abuses taking place in Afghanistan take a central position in the US approach to that country was the threat to security. Only then did those longstanding human rights abuses become a reason to initiate or to continue with military action. So what we see in Afghanistan is a process by which security interests led to greater value being placed on human rights interests. This leads me to a second point concerning the interlinking of security and humanitarian rationales. Now this process of security interests leading to human rights interests in Afghanistan was viewed by a lot of people as a significant problem for human rights. It signaled the securitization of human rights. It was a troubling reminder that the United States will intervene militarily in humanitarian emergencies 
only if the country believes that vital security interests are at stake. These same critics urge that human rights should be worthy of intervention for their own sake, that consequentialist approaches to human rights protection would devalue the inherent fundamental value of the rights that simply ought to be protected. We saw these same dynamics in the US decision to intervene in Libya last year, these same discussions about consequentialist approaches to human rights. Now, in some circles, of course, the intervention was criticized as pretext, as regime change disguised as humanitarianism. But even amid supporters of the intervention, we saw some reluctance to admit that there were national interests, security interests at work there. This intervention was greeted widely as a triumph for the responsibility to protect. It was a sign, people said, that the United States and that the rest of the Security Council understood that massive human suffering in a faraway place is worthy of, and indeed necessitates, military intervention. But a closer look at the stated objectives for the US intervention indicate that it wasn't purely humanitarian motives at work, at least in the way that the intervention was presented to the public. President Obama made headlines last year when he justified the intervention in Libya to the American people by reference to a responsibility to act. Now, this wasn't the first time that the Obama administration had advocated a responsibility to protect vulnerable populations. In his Nobel address, President Obama argued that all responsible nations must embrace the role that militaries with a clear mandate can play to prevent violence against civilians or to stop civil wars. In her first address before the UN Security Council, uh, permanent represent representative Susan Rice avowed that the United States takes seriously the responsibility of the international community to protect civilians from violations of international humanitarian law. At the International Peace Institute later that year, Ambassador Rice described the principle of a responsibility to protect as bold and important <laughs> and expressed the support of the United States for that principle. And perhaps most significantly, the United States National Security Strategy stated that the United States, with its partners in the United Nations, has endorsed the concept of a responsibility to protect. Now, this mere expression of support for the principle of a responsibility to protect by the Obama administration marked something of a shift from the Bush administration, which had supported uh, the General Assembly and Security Council's endorsements of a responsibility to protect, but which led the charge in also diluting those statements. So when the Obama administration um, seemed to embrace a responsibility to protect in advocating intervention in Libya, the policy seemed to mark a shift and one that merited some celebration in some circles. But a deeper examination of the US public remarks reveal that although glimpses of humanitarian rationales appear in the justifications for intervention, the United States characterized the motivation for this action as guided primarily by security interests and only secondarily by a sense of responsibility regardless of that interest. So one point I should make here is that I'm not trying to suggest that public remarks are a window into the soul of the US government. <laughs> I recognize that public remarks don't necessarily represent the true rationales for government action. But what I am interested in here is the public justification for the decision to support intervention in Libya, how this decision was sold, what, what reasons were offered up to the public. So in the first speech on the Libyan intervention after the imposition of the no-fly zone, Obama outlined his approach to the situation. And he did cite a responsibility to act, but he didn't frame this in the same way that the responsibility to protect principle does, as a responsibility to act simply when innocent persons are subject to violence. Instead, Obama asserted that the responsibility to, a to act is triggered when our interests and values are at stake. That, he said, is what happened in Libya. <laughs> 
And he went on to emphasize the unique characteristics of the conflict that made it appropriate for intervention. Anticipating concerns that people would worry that intervention in Libya would lead to intervention everywhere, he cautioned that there were particular circumstances compelling intervention this time around, in this particular country, he said, and at this particular moment. So far from an embrace of intervention for purely altruistic reasons, Obama explained that this was an exceptional situation that called for intervention, while other crises would not. The clear emphasis in the justification was on the United States, on the capacity of the United States to intervene, and on the national interest of the US in doing so. This isn't to say that a duty to prevent the suffering of others didn't play into Obama's justification. After outlining those particular and unique circumstances, he did discuss America's responsibility as a leader and more profoundly, our responsibilities to our fellow human beings. This is a moment where that sense of responsibility of altruism does shine, but it is a side point at best. It was less than a minute in a speech of more than 26. So instead of letting that responsibility stand on its own, Obama buttressed the point by explaining the strategic interests of the United States in preventing violence in Libya in order to prevent refugee flows into neighboring countries, to dispel the notion that repressive leaders could use violence to cling to power, and to preserve the credibility of the UN Security Council. So in the justification of the US government, the work of protecting individuals from suffering around the world is important to the United States, not simply because others have a right not to suffer, but because enhancing their security enhances that of the United States. The US emphasis was on not responsibility, but on interest. Now this shouldn't come as a surprise. Obama was obviously trying to sell intervention, not simply to the US public, but to a war-weary public. And so this meant that framing the intervention as necessary to protect American interests was obviously very important. So what does all of this mean? This isn't necessarily bad news for those who support intervention in humanitarian crises. That the United States views intervention as touching on the security interests is something of a triumph of itself. If the US sees the rights of others as touching on the security interests of the United States, then it's more likely that the government will use its power and resources in the future for those humanitarian purposes that are within the national interest. Advocates of humanitarian intervention will also uh, probably take comfort in a cautious approach by the United States on this question of a responsibility to protect, given the great concern that that pr principle is a Western tool, an opportunity for abuse, a pretext for uh, colonialist intervention. But still, an accurate description of the stated justification for intervention in Libya should recognize that what the United States advocated there is different from a responsibility to protect. It was instead a confluence of American interests with the circumstances under which the responsibility to protect principle does call for intervention. So why not admit that? or even acknowledge the benefits of this confluence of interests and values, rather than saying this was purely altruism at work, there's a great <laughs> emphasis on purity in motives, just as we saw in the reaction to those humanitarian goals in Afghanistan. But given the deep commitments that are required for a state to engage in military action, as we all know well in this room, it should be expected that these decisions will only be made when there are interests at stake. Michael Walzer has noted that mixed motives in war are, if in fact, a practical advantage. In the absence of security interests, many interventions, he said, that ultimately had some positive humanitarian impact never would have taken place. So one way to think about the intersection of security and military interests in Afghanistan is to consider it a process of tainting human rights concerns, a securitization of human rights. 
But another way to think about this is that security interests provide one more way of promoting humanitarian objectives. The difficulty, of course, is what happens when there are no security interests at stake in the humanitarian crisis. This is ultimately what this responsibility to protect principle is about. It's about consistency in outcomes. So the problem with welcoming mixed motives is that the Rwandas will still go by unnoticed because there wasn't a significant security interest triggering intervention there. That is what R2P, the responsibility to protect, is trying to get at. But the solution to that problem may be convincing states that human rights are a part of security interests, not criticizing states for considering their security interests in deciding on humanitarian intervention. So this leads me to the final point. For all of the mistakes and the tragedies of the war, Afghanistan seemed to show that there is a critical linkage between failed states, massive human rights abuses, and terrorism. So the situation in Afghanistan just demonstrated that the collapse of the institutions of the state may produce consequences beyond poverty, oppression, and disorder for the state's own population. Reflecting on this war, on the lives lost in it, and on any progress made for the people of Afghanistan in it might be a helpful way of understanding not only that massive human rights abuses are linked to security threats, but also that massive human rights abuses can't be solved by military force alone. Afghanistan could be a way of demonstrating that pursuing humanitarian objectives early in a human rights crisis is crucial to preventing failing states in the first place <coughs> and in preventing those failing states from turning into security threats. Thank you. I realize that <clears throat> what I've been thinking about is nearly the very flip side of what you've been talking about. Um, so I'll, I'll start by asking a different question um, than the one that you asked, sort of the opposite question. That is, if, if security interests led to a greater emphasis in, on human rights interests in Afghanistan and um, became a basis for continuing operations there or expanding them in certain ways, then one question that could be asked is the question that you posed, which is the concern that human rights should be protected in their own right rather than as a follow-on. My question would be, if armed intervention would not in and of itself have been permissible uh, as a method for advancing human rights in a given context, um, then does it become so, or rather, it does not become so just because we happen to be armed in, Af in Afghanistan? So I, I think that the, the problem with responsibility to protect, once we are talking not about sanctions but about armed interventions, um, becomes, in fact, much more complex. And in fact, Garth Evans, who, as you know, was um, very instrumental in developing the responsibility to protect framework, um, was very dismayed at the Libya intervention and very vocally um, expressed his vocal consternation that uh, that principle was being used as a basis for that particular armed intervention. The problem is that, put simply, there are almost no Rwandas. It's almost always more complicated than that. So let me sort of circle back around and, and suggest why, why I would say that. It seems to me that we've achieved very little um, in the counterterrorism context of the past decade in trying to accommodate security and human rights um, within that, within a coherent framework. Um, and law of war, similarly. I think we've, we've lost a great deal in law of war terms in our prosecution of the so-called war on terror. Just looking at Afghanistan alone, um, seems to me the first and major loss is our um, destabilizing the clear protection, POW protection, for regular armed forces. 
by re rejecting recognition of POW status for Taliban um, members, it, se it seems to me we've put back into play an issue that had been put to rest as far as the status of regular armed forces captured in armed conflicts. And then with regard to Al-Qaeda, we've accomplished virtually nothing, it seems to me, um, in seeking to apply existing law that's ill-fitting uh, to a, a new type of conflict. And we've got now de detention and targeting going on for years on end without suitable law and in some cases without public law uh, on how that's to be done or um, under what conditions that's permissible. And it's come about, not surprisingly, I mean, who, in whose interest was it going to be to legislate or otherwise promulgate law on, on this, these two issues? The certainly neocon or conservative um, participants in this debate were not interested in congressional um, action, much more for the most part in executive action. And human rights advocates or civil liberties advocates uh, didn't want it reduced to writing, somehow thinking that if we didn't have legislation legitimizing the practice that somehow it would pass and um, it wouldn't lie around like a loaded gun to quote Robert Jackson if we just didn't write it down. So, and it was a loser for any uh, senator or congressman to take this on as a major issue. So it, it was unsurprising when it ended up being left in the hands of the executive and or the courts. And given that choice, the executive has uh, stepped in to try to keep the courts at bay as much as possible. Uh, so that you have very strange um, oral arguments in which the Obama administration argues for its basically unfettered executive discretion. Very, very uh, surprising turn of events. And then, of course, in terms of practical abilities, we've uh, left ourselves virtually without a detention facility that we're willing to use. Um, so if we were to have a need to detain, we're at this point using ships at sea and are not in a position to take any large number of prisoners. Um, we put ourselves in, it seems to me, put ourselves in, in quite a fix. And of course, um, we have no clear and public um, legal theory for uh, targeting in uh, drone operations. That is, particular targeting. Yes, there's a sort of general theory out there of if another government is unable or unwilling, but in terms of who is particularly targeted, we do not have clear and public law on that. We have a Detention and targeting problem that at least on, uh, in, at the first cut has a lot to do with the problem specific to engaging in a conflict with a complicated and clandestine private organization. So that's new uh, to some extent, not entirely new, but most of the development of law in the, over the last century that has dealt with private actors um, has been these sort of ambiguous papering over uh, compromises about partisans and resistance fighters that now leave us not particularly well um, situated to make a next step. We're not even writing on a clear empty slate. We're writing on a slate that is itself in intention, the result of an intentional ambiguity in previous agreements and treaties. So <laughs> the the upshot at this point is, I, th I think, uh, a, a terribly unclear and unsitu situation and one that's not good for human rights or civil rights or security. Um, in fact, I was noting uh, when the Attorney General was talking about surveillance, <clears throat> he said that absolutely not. He recognized that the U.S. government did not have the uh, authority to surveil U.S. citizens even when they're out of the country. And I thought, how ironic, but you can kill them. Right? You, but you can't listen to what they're saying. I mean, how, how do we get to the point where those things coexist and are not even, there isn't, there isn't even a felt need to, to reconcile them? <clears throat> 
military commissions we're, we're starting up again with. Um, but so far, the, the one thing that they, they have shown themselves to be useful for is getting out of Guantanamo, right? Of, the, um, of those few handful of people who have been convicted by military commissions, um, Hicks, Hamdan are back home. Cotter, it appears, will be um, going back to Canada soon. It doesn't seem to me, I mean, not to be excessively grim, that we've, um, in terms of lessons learned, uh, learned a great deal so far. Why? Well, there's the obvious problem. It's a, a difficult type of conflict and difficult type of conflict to legislate for. But beyond that, I think that there's a, a deeper quandary that we've been confronting unsuccessfully since approximately the Roman Empire, uh, which is response to rebels. The, the categorization, our understanding of, and in many ways, our huge crush on revolutionaries on the one hand, that's like sort of one image, the, the heroic um, fighter in the American Revolution, the French Revolution, all, all these um, great advances that we, we view as coming out of a certain revolutionary ethic, I'll, I'll say. Um, whereas on the other hand, there's you know, the, the bad rebel, the usurper, and worse. And we've really not, in, in the development of law of war, we've sort of gotten the brigand pirate thing kind of under control. We treat that as private, generally, and various other categories that have, the, uh, the barbarian, we've sort of eliminated that as in bad repute. And, gotten down to where we have our concept of lawful combatants, legitimate combatants, and then this remaining very ambiguous, very ambivalent category about revolutionaries, liberators, or on the other hand, those who would in intervene, with, intervene by force to take power. So you've got traitor or hero, guerrilla or partisan, treason or national liberation, terrorism or jihad, Syrian spring or terrorist attack. It it's, doesn't seem to me that we've advanced to the point where we have anything to say about exactly why it is that one insurgency is an insurgency and another insurgency is a liberation and a third insurgency is a, a terrorist attack to be dealt with in, within that category. That's not to say, by the way, that it's all the same or there's no value to, <clears throat> to place greater value on one than on a, quite the reverse. The pr our problem is that we don't have within a, a liberal framework the ability to articulate those kinds, that, that kind of a hierarchy, those kinds of choices. And we're left not articulating an underlying theory of who can use force, why, when, when is it legitimate, what, what's a legitimate response, particularly where it's a private actor. And of course, where you have a rebellion or a revolution, it's always a private actor to begin with. And we, we don't have a theory of that. And we've never, for, for centuries in, in certainly Western thought, um, had any ability to, to answer Locke's question of, well, what do you do? What do you do when not just the, the current occupants of office, but your system has failed? Locke, of course, said you will be appealed to heaven, which seems about like where we're at now. Because Al-Qaeda's take on the world, from what, I, what little I understand of it, is that there's a great deal wrong with, I'll say, the West, and with the West's treatment of, um, I don't even know what population to, to define or what landmass to define, but that the, whatever the objections are, the U.S. and the West are impeding the, the rights of those that Al-Qaeda purports to represent, and that 
the regular interstate system won't work for this because there, the governments of the states in the Arab world, which is where um, initially, at least, uh, in terms of bin Laden and so on, um, what he would have been thinking about would have been representation, for example, by the Saudi government. Well, that wasn't going to happen in his view because the Saudi government was captured by the very same Western interests that he was objecting to. So while we've thought in the past about rebellions or revolutions as being basically national events, now we have two problems, right? We, we consider them in the past largely national events and largely national events in which we would not intervene. And then two major changes put us in a very different posture now and one that's very unsettled and unregulated and, and I think um, to our peril is, remains very unregulated. One is, of course, the, the advance of human rights as an international concern. That, uh, and then the uh, responsibility to protect IDEA, very much not worked out yet, very much not put into, not reconciled with the UN Charter, among other things. Um, but that destabilizes, uh, for better and for worse, in my view, the non-intervention uh, status quo, that, or, or default position, put it that way. So that it's no longer clear that you treat even a domestic um, civil war the way that we might have at one time. The other factor, of course, is this globalization of grievance, where the claims of rebels, um, how, how it, in whichever version of that we envision a particular group, are no longer um, defined by national borders. So that the rebel now is a transnational actor, and in all the various guises, whether it's the bad guy or the good guy, or however you want to view it, it's no longer just a, a one-state matter. So that, that problem that we've failed to address adequately or successfully I mean, for many, many centuries now is much more complicated uh, insofar as it's transnational. So, I mean, we weren't able to explain, or at least I've never been able to adequately explain to myself why the American Revolution was a wonderful thing and so was the outcome of the Civil War. But we've not reconciled for ourselves which rebellions are okay and which rebellions are not. And we now look at the next set of questions in the transnational level um, without that coherent basis to start from. So it makes it much more difficult in terms of practical <clears throat> definition of current legal frameworks that we would apply. It makes it much more difficult when we lack a coherent underlying um, conceptualization, an underlying matrix that we're really comfortable with uh, and, and have confidence in. So our lack of confidence in the underlying matrix or our underlying thinking about this is always the, um, in some ways positive, but also paralyzing um, caution um, that then leaves us with ill-defined law in a situation where seemingly in order to advance human rights, protect civil liberties, and so on, we have pulled back for lots of complicated ground level reasons, but also um, comprehensible overarching reasons that we've pulled back from articulating very clearly when we target, who we target, who do we detain, why do we prosecute, and how do we go forward from here? Such that I think we're in very precarious posture already, uh, and certainly um, with any uh, significant shock to the system, will be in unprepared shape as we were a decade ago.
So we now have a chance to uh, continue the conversation uh, in the question and answer period. Um, I'll start things off by asking one. If you have a question, please just raise your hand. Um, I'll call on you. Uh, let, let us know who uh, to whom you'd like to like to direct your question. Um, I have one for Andrew. Um, uh, uh, it's a question about the uh, the causal story, a potential uh, version of the causal story um, behind the kind of broken windows um, mm -hmm. uh, approach that you got here, which I think is fascinating. Um, and I was really struck by the, the general picking up the gun. Um, and, and I presume that when he does that, um, what the general is worried about is is not just the person who spit out the gun, uh, which is a cause for concern, you want to figure out who that is, um, but also the person who might see it, uh, who might step in it, um, otherwise be, be affected. Um, because it's not just that the spit out gum or the broken window is an indication of something, but it also incentivizes certain kinds of mm -hmm. behavior. People see it, they react to it, it signals something about the system. The system breaking uh, breaking down. So if you have a broken window that nobody sees, you know, as a, a tree falling in the forest, perhaps. Um, and I wonder then, in terms of seeing the seeing the uh, you know the hair out of place or the rumpled uniforms or even the abuse itself, the story here has to be a lot about just increased visibility generally, right? Mm -hmm. We have these so many more mechanisms now for seeing um, seeing the gum, seeing the broken windows. There's mm -hmm. you know the, the soldiers have their they're taking cell phone pictures there's facebook there's youtube there's embedded journalists and, and information is getting out in ways that maybe it didn't before both to the sort of maybe relevant communities within the prison or wherever else or in, and to the larger the, 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 the sort of larger world and i just wonder if that if that seems to you maybe part of the part of the causal story yeah um, well so maybe i'll i think there are two questions there one is what is the causal story can we know what it is and then two does transparency cut either way. And it might depend on the causal story, but it might also be useful to be more transparent. You might see a regulatory effect of transparency regardless of the causal story. So even if we don't know why it is the case that strict rule enforcement imbues a particular situation with the, a rule abiding attitude on everyone's part, could be lots of different reasons why. But even if we don't know why, enhanced transparency might have the effect of increased rule abidingness. Um, and actually, there was a report by um, Juan Mendez, who's the special rapporteur on torture right now, um, about just this question. And he, well, not, not exactly, but close. He said, we don't exactly know why, but it seems to be the case that when someone is watching, people behave better. <laughs> Um, there are obviously I mean, good reasons come to mind for why someone would be, follow the rules when someone is watching, um, but we still don't know exactly the mechanism. It could be different for different people, different in different situations. And he said that he actually recommended it in a number of different situations where he was consulting with uh, militaries and national security groups. In particular, this came out of a consultation with the National Guard in Spain he recommended installing cameras in uh, interrogation rooms that hadn't been there before. And without a clear causal mechanism, the idea was cameras, uh, even if someone isn't reviewing the tape, the cameras could have an effect. And this is something that we do domestically all the time. You know, We have cameras up, and we don't just put them up in a secret location. We put them up with a big sign that says, this area is monitored by surveillance. Um, then on the first question of what is, what is the causal story or what might be the causal story, um, I just want to be clear because broken windows is so loaded and there's so, been such heavy critique of broken windows policing. It's, it's crucial to, to keep in mind that broken windows policing has been criticized and, and shown to be bunk in a lot of contexts where it's been implemented. But that's very different from saying that we have proven that uh, the broken windows theory that animates the bunk broken windows policies is broken. In experimental settings, that theory has been shown to be pretty robust. We, there was a study in science that came out just a few months ago that showed that, um, uh, of course, this is an experimental setting and extrapolating up to city level or even the, an entire military command unit level is tricky. But in this setting, they found that um, little signs of disorder, like graffiti and litter, drastically increased the chances that people would break minor rules. This was a, a, actually an experimental setting, but it was outside of a real cafe with people who had no idea they were taking part in the experiment. Where there was graffiti on the walls and litter, people were much more likely to do things like litter. Um, and in fact, actually, rates of bike theft went up. Um, so, so that idea that the environment itself could send a signal that could, not just the fear of sanction, but that send a signal about community norms about rule abidingness or rule breakingness, um, I think is, is a valid point. And we, even though we haven't identified the, isolated the individual mechanism that's doing the work, 
in a number of different situations. And then I'm, I'm hopeful that transparency, regardless of the known mechanism, could have an effect. Wonderful. So I'll, I'll open the floor. Uh, if you have a question, please just uh, raise your hand. <laughs> Sorry, back then. If you could introduce yourself and speak up, please. Sure. Uh, I'm uh, Steve Strick. I'm a legal officer from the Canadian Forces. Thank you to the panelists. It was a very informative panel. My my question is for uh, Professor Mohammed, uh, just with regards to the uh, what you mentioned is you know what I can call almost a hybrid R2P concept that may be forthcoming with this linkage to national interests and and certainly I think such a concept may be. Fenema really to the proponents of R2P, which exactly, you know, which as you know, any linkage of national interest begets imperialism, which begets the classic R2P imperialist debate. So I'm just wondering on your views as, do you feel that R2P, with regards to the Libyan operation, took a step backwards? Or do you feel that some, that now we almost have this hybrid R2P concept that could be going, that really is a, is a new calculus to determine humanitarian intervention? Thanks, that's a great um, set of questions. So on the, on the first um, point about um, whether uh, we're seeing sort of a new hybrid R2P, I don't think we are, but I think maybe we should. Um, I, I think over the last year, in the, in the characterizations of the decision to intervene in Libya, so I, I contrast that with the actual operation, but in the decision to intervene in Libya, there's been, um, like I said, such an emphasis on trying to describe it as this you know, purely humanitarian um, uh, intervention, that this really was about um, sort of protecting the people of Libya. This really was about a sense of moral responsibility, which suggests to me that there's some distaste for suggesting that 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 security interests were a big part of this also, um, um, and maybe the biggest part of this. Um, and so that, to me, says that the, the proponents of R2P, anyway, aren't ready to go there. Um, that said, you know, if you look at um, sort of beyond the, the sort most simple statement of what the responsibility to protect that original document from 2001 says and really read the whole thing the drafters of of the of the original report i think were were pretty um uh cognizant of the fact that national interests have to be at work when we're talking about military intervention. Um, so, so responsibility to protect covers a range of interventions and covers a, a, a time period also from a responsibility to protect through a responsibility to react through a responsibility to rebuild. And they include in that um, peaceful mechanisms, early mechanisms, as much as they include military intervention. Um, but military intervention Intervention obviously has gotten the most attention, and the and the responsibility to react has gotten the most attention. Um, and the and the drafters of the original principle said, we you know we get that that states are not going to go to war when they don't have an interest in doing so. But that um, sort of nuance has has largely been taken out of. Um, kind of the, the bigger public discussions about what the principle means. And I think in the bigger public discussion about what the principle means, there has been this real emphasis on um, kind of purity of, um, purity of motivations. Um, and I think, I think some of that is coming out of kind of a, a tradition in human rights advocacy of trying to stay away from um, kind of the, the, the consequentialist approach to rights protection. Um, and some of it is coming out of this concern about consistency, that, that what we really are worried about are the situations in which nationalist interests aren't going to drive um, uh, uh, powerful states to notice what's happening. You know, it is the Rwanda situation that's largely at work in um, the construction of the responsibility to protect principle in the first place. And so that is another reason that um, that the security interests are sort of looked down upon and that I don't think we're going to see, at least out of that kind of group, a hybrid principle emerging. I think in practice, maybe this is what we're seeing. And I, and I also think that's that's important. I think we could do better to focus less on A, reaction, and B, military reaction. But, um, but I think, at least in practice, it's moving in that direction. 
Um, on the second question about whether the Libya intervention is a step backwards, um, I think yes. Um, and this is another place where I separate out um, the initial decision to intervene from the from the operation of the intervention itself. Um, so, so Garth Evans, for example, is someone who is very supportive of the initial decision to intervene. He's you know he's used that um, in sort of the last year as a way of saying responsibility to protect has triumphed. Right. This is this is we we have a sign that the the powerful governments of the world recognize that they have a duty um, to step in when when innocent. people people are being harmed. Um, and so to the extent that that decision did just that, I think that was important. But the, the operation after that, I think, has, has done some damage to R2P um, in a couple of senses. You know, one is just the simple fact that um, the intervention was initially framed and authorized as um, as a very limited um, protection of no-fly zone or enforcement of the no-fly zone and protection of civilians. And it looked like um, NATO was going beyond those limited objectives and really going for regime change. So this did. Um, I think the, the UN ambassador to India said um, uh, at some point, I think last August or so, after um, a little less than six months, I guess, of this operation, that Libya has given R2P a bad name. Um, and so I think um, in, in sort of the year since then, um, R2P is, has, has sort of gained back some of the suspicion that was around it in the first place. Um, and I think the sort of debates and inaction in, in on Syria have done the same thing. More questions? I see we have microphones hi. going around. Um, hi, uh, David Shanzer from across the street at the uh, Sanford School. I'd like to ask Madeline, my friend Madeline, uh, uh, let me suggest two criteria that you might, doesn't get you all the way there, but maybe helps us try to distinguish between various level types of insurgencies, terrorist movements. Uh, one of which would be, you know, an evaluation of the legitimacy of the actor to truly represent uh, a constituency. Al-Qaeda uh, nominated itself, uh, had no elements of any sort of uh, democratic or other uh, ways to demonstrate le legitimacy of its claim that it represented the entire world's Muslim population. Uh, so, uh, and second, uh, the tactics that a group uh, uses. And uh, excuse me, with my first one, I mean, one of the reasons we've gone into, there are a lot of reasons, but we went into Libya, but we didn't go into Syria, was a lot of some questions about the opposition group in Syria and the extent that they were unified and the legitimacy of their claims to represent the uh, Syrian opposition to uh, Assad. Uh, and we didn't have the same level of concerns in, in Libya. Uh, and the, the second criteria being the tactics uh, that are used. The, uh, Syri the Libyan opposition did not uh, uh, try to advance its cause by killing civilians. They went after legitimate government targets, and Al Qaeda, of course, has uh, uh, used almost exclusively uh, acts against uh, civilians. And in terms of the development of international law, I just want wondering if you could comment on whether, and a lot of the justification for the drone strikes and all has been based on the common law of anticipatory self defense, and. Uh, you know, there is a bit of law on that in terms of the Israeli strikes against the nuclear reactors and the mining of the Nicaraguan harbors and things like that. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, it's not a highly developed area, but it certainly uh, can, can be used to justify, uh, at least uh, when al-Qaeda was a more potent <laughs> force, uh, uh, some of the tac actions that the government has used against it. Yeah. I agree with all of that. The problem is in operationalizing it. If it would be a good principle that where an insurgency is representative or in that sense majoritarian, that it would be treated um, more favorably than where it's um, in the minority um, within that population, or where its tactics are reprehensible, or with regard to drone strikes, obviously there's um, self-defense gets us at least started on talking about a legal basis. The problem in each instance is operationalizing that. So how do you know 
with regard to a particular insurgency as it's developing, how representative it is. Sometimes you, you might have a basis. Most of the time you wouldn't. Uh, and where you've got a um, not bifurcated but um, multiply uh, divided society, it becomes that much more difficult to, to figure out um, what, what a vote would look like. Um, and as to tactics, yeah, it, it matters, but one, it's not always clear. Sometimes it's quite clear, but often it's not quite clear what the tactics are. And the tactics can't be dispositive. Um, if tactics were dispositive, then again, we wouldn't find uh, um, I don't think we would end up where we want to be. For example, if on, um, on September 11th only the Pentagon had been attacked, would that change everything? I, I'm not convinced that, that that's by itself um, a dispositive uh, determinant. Similarly, with drone strikes, yeah, where, we, where a drone strike is in self-defense, then leaving aside the uh, territorial rights of the third state in which the drone is operating, leaving that aside, then yes, where, where um, self-defense is warranted, um, that's a legal basis. But the question, of course, is what's, what is the, um, standard and procedure for identification? And what's the accountability for uh, selecting targets, carrying out targets? What if they're the right targets, the wrong targets? What's the, how, how dangerous does the, per if the, and if it's the right person, how dangerous does that person have to be? And how um, imminent is the threat that they pose? All of those things uh, get, are, are the follow-on questions after, yes, it's, it, the basis in self-defense is certainly the starting point. Yeah. Based on the, you know, discrimination and protecting civilians and all that. Right. Things. Why isn't it pretty much parallel uh, to that same process, which is well established? Mm -hmm. It has procedures. They're not transparent, uh, but uh, they're internal to the, the the government. But what about the difference? The difference is the the um, form stru structure of the conflict. That is where the in terms of international law, less so with uh, domestic uh, regulation or internal policy, but even there, we are experienced with and have designed uh, rules for traditional armed conflicts, where you've got somebody uh, in, in a, it was a member of a regular armed force that's identifiable, may, probably, supposedly, wearing uniform, uh, where you have a theater of operations that's discreet and where discrimination is really possible in, in a pretty robustly effective way. But where you're talking about picking off some particular guy in his car driving across the desert, and it might be the right guy, it might not be the right guy, or worse yet, in a, an urban environment where you, you think you've got the right guy and there isn't a, a regular battlefield situation where you can readily identify uh, both who the enemy is and the imminence of the threat that they pose, those, those differences, I think, are critical. Uh, excuse me, my name is Grant Smithson. I'm a lawyer from Charlotte. Um, the question I have is dealing with classification. I may sound a little uh, jaundice or cynical, but doesn't it really come down to our guys versus your guys? And the reason I say that is because we've had many examples, for example, the Cuban uh, revolution with Fidel Castro. Uh, at the beginning, uh, the Eisenhower administration fully embraced the Castro government, and then it found that there were violations and they were leaning toward a communist regime and to be further uh, buttressed by the Soviet Union. So he was our guy at one time, and then he was their guy another time. In Afghanistan, the Mujahideen, they were our guys, and they uh, opted, or they morphed into the Taliban. So they're no longer our guys, they're the bad guys. And also in uh, Nicaragua, you had the Somozan government, and then you had the Sandinistas, and they were our guys for a short period of time. Then they weren't, because they leapt over to the socialist communist uh, realm. So the Contras were then our guys, the Sandinistas, 
were those guys. So isn't it really just a, a classification if they will serve our interest or they go against our interest? They are on our team. They may be bastards, but there are bastards. Um, and I'm very serious about this because a model that we've seen historically is in Latin America. We've tolerated regimes that have detained and killed uh, numerous thousands of people in Brazil and in Argentina, and we support those regimes. Now, fortunately, they became democratic uh, governments. But it seems to me that the United States seems to pick and choose right and left. Uh, the Sunnis in Iraq were sometimes the bad guys. We then bought them off, and they came up to our side. And so there are guys. So it really doesn't make any sense how you label them generically. It's that whatever group we seem or we deem to be important to our interest. And I think humanitarianism is good, but I think the intersection is not as close as we think it is. I think it's more in our self-interest and our national view or international view that determines the classifications. And I'd like to, any of you to comment on that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but how do you also turn that into law? I mean, that's part of the answer, but part of what governance is about is reconciling that all, and those interests and the importance of that and the reality of that with other considerations of who, who we decide are our guys. And it doesn't always, I, I understand that where you have a bipolar world, it's pretty easy to figure out. But it becomes less and less easy to figure out, I think, since the end of the Cold War. And go ahead, yeah. schizophrenia. It just seems to vacillate, and I can see why there is no basis to have any sort of law that can cover that particular situation. And so when we could have Marines that could possibly intervene in, in uh, Liberia to deal with the Charles Taylor government, but we don't do a thing in the Republic or Democratic Republic of the Congo where there are five million people who allegedly have been, di who have been dying as a result of unchecked warlords who use every degree of atrocity to promote their political interest, if there is a political interest other than oppression. And that bothers you. Of course it does. That's why it's complicated. <laughs> yeah, right? Thanks. Because, you know, where is our, how do we define our interests, including that? That bothers us. Well, it seems to me what she's saying is that you do not have Can I Isn't just, that what you were talking about? You were talking about the intersection yeah, of the so, area and the national security. Right. If you don't have the national security, then humanitarian interests are, aren't valid. I think, let, let's hear what yeah. Professor Mahama has to say. Yeah, and so I think, uh, yes, absolutely, right? So we see um, a number of situations where if there is no uh, apparent security interest, the humanitarian interests at least aren't significant enough to motivate um, either military intervention or sometimes even other kinds of in in intervention, coercive intervention or not. Um, I think this is what this responsibility to protect humanitarian intervention, human rights advocacy movement is trying to, trying to get at. And one way that it's trying to get at it is by convincing governments that, or by, by two ways. One way is to convince governments that um, uh, humanitarian interests are a part of security interests. So I think this is something that we see happening um, in kind of the understanding of Afghanistan. Um, the other way to do it is um, uh, to try to convince governments that um, 
the humanitarian interests on their own are worthwhile. Um, that's hard to do. Obviously, it's very hard to do. And one way that I think this responsibility to protect movement is trying to do it is by um, sort of upping what I would describe as um, the power of shaming. Um, so there, if there aren't sort of material security interests that are attached to humanitarian concerns, how do we convince states to act? Well, maybe through behavioral norms, through community norms, by convincing states that they'll suffer some other sanctions and reputation, um, or even in some material sanction, if they don't um, behave the way they ought to behave. Um, I don't think this has been a very powerful motivator of behavior at this point. Maybe it can be. Um, I'm not so convinced, but I think this is at least the goal. Can I just say one last thing about the, that question? I think um, I, I wanted to say this anyway. I noticed that all three of our comments, this is lessons learned from, you know, learn, lessons about human rights learned in the war on terror. And it sounds like your question is getting at this. One of the big lessons learned is that politics mucks things up. Um, I mean, in, implicit in my comments was, th was that idea. It was implicit, I think, also in, in the other comments that were made. So I, I didn't mention this, but I was thinking of mentioning it that there's I'm assuming many of you have heard about or seen the Coney 2012 video, this massively successful human rights video, uh, viral campaign, about actually con you know, Central African atrocities committed by a warlord. And there were a huge number of critiques of the video because the video was essentializing. It took this complex situation, what I was talking about, it didn't focus on the situation, it focused on the individual. And it said that all of Uganda's problems are the result of one man who is evil and must be stopped. And when the NGO was asked, why was that your message, when you know that it's more complicated than that, they said, because that's what works. That's politically powerful, to point a finger at someone who's de who we can describe as evil. I think it's the same explanation that Sarah gave for why R2P has been blended into this new hybrid form, and it's the same explanation that Madeline gave for why we don't have um, an open conversation about, for example, targeting practices, that things, you know, no, no politician will touch it because the politics is too, is too messy. And so decisions are made in secret, and that raises all sorts of other concerns. Um, Hi, Tom Earhart. I'm, uh, I work in the headquarters of the U.S. Air Force in the Pentagon. And um, just, just uh, with all due deference to General Dunlap, a, a really quick comment and a question. The comment is that the, for the military, the R2P is to the Constitution and the American people first, and it's a clear priority, and that is the, the first responsibility. But the military also feels an R2S, which is a responsibility to succeed. And so the, 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 the probability that a particular action is going to actually result in some positive outcome for the American people and the Constitution has to be a part of, of, of you know, whether or not an intervention occurs. And in, in that regard, I was really struck uh, by Andrew's discussion, and I'd like to ask you this question, about the role of discipline in, in achieving, uh, that would be, in this particular case, the discipline of the occupying army mm. in achieving uh, better human rights outcomes. So two parts to that. The first part is th the difficulty of trying to achieve marginal increases in that kind of discipline in any particular circumstance when a fundamental aspect of what, what military training is all about is the achieving of maximum uh, levels of discipline, mm. right? So how do you get how do you get extra increments of that, number one, and how do you find and ferret out those, those units who, through lack of leadership, have degraded to the point where they're going to commit these kinds of atrocities? And that's my first, the, the first question is, is, is in that era, area. And the second one is, there are all kinds, as, as Professor Mohammed said, there, there, there are all kinds of other agencies that we want to be intervening as well, especially earlier on in, in a nation's or in an in area's um, retrogression in terms of internal security and human rights. And here we have agencies who have no culture of, 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 of discipline like yeah. this with the military. They have no sort of standards. They don't have a UCMJ. They don't have uh, uniforms per se. And we see a lot of problems in this area because yeah. when the military interfaces with other uh, NGOs, et cetera, 
we see that in, yeah. in, in spades, right? We see this lack of discipline. We see the lack of leadership. We see the lack of, of sort of the kinds of selflessness that, that, that gets to the, the extraordinarily high levels of discipline that are needed. Mm -hmm. So lots of case studies for the military mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that we could talk about little uh, improvement but for the other agencies, I think lots of improvement that could be made. Could you comment on that, please? Yeah, sure. Um, I'll hazard a guess, um, an answer. It, um, those are really hard questions, um, obviously. I, I, I'll go backwards. So I agree on the second question. I agree that there's a huge, we could call it a governance gap, an accountability gap. Um, there's even a scholarly gap looking at how we are going to close the accountability gap um, when it comes to other actors in a development context, in a broken state, um, in an intervention context. Um, so I, I, I agree that the problem is there, and I agree that there are a lot of lessons to be learned from the military. And actually, that might be the answer to the first question. So I, without saying, without having an answer to how to, um, to how to increase discipline tomorrow, how to figure out what's going to give us the marginal gain in increases in discipline or rule abidingness, I think is going to come from uh, more scientific study of what works and what doesn't work. So um, I, th I think this means more randomized <clears throat> controlled trials. This is something that's being applied in the management context and now in the development context, but is largely been seen as anathema to core human rights questions. But it seems to me, and so you, you can do a randomized controlled trial within a set population, right? where you have a control group and an experimental group. You can't really do it across countries. So it doesn't really work with international law, but it works with international groups that are implementing international law all over the world. So it seems to me, why not military units? Why not have one military unit where they have cameras up, even if the camera, the cord behind the camera is clipped and the camera is just there, and you run it for a year and you find out if you have more or fewer uh, rule violations. You've got a controlled environment there where there's, an, there's already a culture of self-monitoring, um, reporting, and documentation. So it seems like a good place to start to answer that question. They're um, ongoing experiments. That is, yeah. We're constantly doing basic training, right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, so it's, 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 it's right there waiting to be done. Yeah. yeah. Hi, my name is Taylor Hayes. Um, my pro I'm from Campbell Law School. My question is for Mr. Woods. Um, I know you said, I know you said, Mr. Woods, that we can't assume that there's there's a causal relationship between the gum being on the ground and um, abuses mm. of prisoners. But if we could assume that there was a relationship between grooming standards or gum being on the ground and abuses of the prisoners, what would keep the gum being on the ground from, what, could, what would keep impeccable discipline from just causing impeccable abuse? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, the, the, so the Nazis had cleanly pressed uniforms, right? Um, it's not the case. I, I should have said this. I, I don't think, I think what I'm, when we talk about these kinds of behavioral regulatory mechanisms where you get at X by going after Y uh, or focusing on the situation and not the individual, it's not a substitute for other forms of regulation. It's a complement, it's an attempt to achieve that marginal gain. Um, or it's, or it's, an, it's an alternate strategy where you don't have proper enforcement mechanisms. That's why I think it might have so much purchase in the human rights context where we're struggling to use normal rule of law tools to achieve regulatory outcomes. Um, but I don't by any stretch want to suggest that, um, that these insights have, a, have an inherent political or normative valence. They, I think that you know, systems of power and control can be used for good and for bad. Um, and I also think that they're not going to solve all problems. Um, so even if we figured out how to reduce abuse, we're figuring it out within a context of a group that wants to reduce it. Um, and the same thing, I think you're right, could be flipped to, in, to increase it. But that might actually speak to where transparency could be helpful. I mean, you can try to think of ways to integrate that approach with um, safeguards, outside monitoring. There's a question back here. Uh, Near, could, could you take the microphone? It'll help for the recording, yeah. Thanks. Okay, so my name is Nir and I'm from Israel, and my question is to uh, Mr. Woods. Um, 
the first question I wanted to ask was about the Nazi regime, because obviously uh, I think it's really problematic to try and settle between uh, minor disciplinary violations and what was happening during the Nazi regime, which I think was extremely disciplinary, and I don't think you would find a gam uh, in a concentration camp. Yeah. Um, but I want to ask a further question. Um, do you think that by attributing responsibility to commanders, hmm. we can actually avoid more and more atrocities by regular soldiers? Yeah, I do actually. Um, I, I mean, the, the concept of command responsibility um, is used in lots of regulatory systems and, and seems to me to make a lot of sense. Um, I haven't seen, I think the answer is yes. And, and, on, the, and on the first question, I guess I'll just say again, I don't think, um, I, I think that the idea is that where there are regulatory systems that have broken down where we could find, we could use, we could look for things like gum on the ground as an indicator of likely abuse. That is not to say that abuse only happens in those situations. One more question. I think we have time for one more question uh, back here. Okay. Uh, my name is Mike Cadence. I'm a retired law professor. Uh, I'm uh, always amazed at, at groups where I can see uh, only a minority of people who were alive during World War II. Um, and um, my question relates to what may be, uh, if anything, not simpler but clearer times. But I rarely notice any more uh, reference to the Geneva Convention and the laws of war. And my question is, in the discussion this morning, does that have any relevance, or is it technologically outdated or irrelevant or whatever? Well, we do have a panel coming up on that, but let's hear what our, our folks have to say. I don't think it's by any means irrelevant, um, but there are lots of features of the current conflict that you can read Geneva all day long and not get an answer to. Well, with that cogent response, uh, we'll, <laughs> we'll take our break. And uh, my version of gum on the ground is uh, oh. <laughs> starting at exactly the right time, the next panel. So we'll be on break till 10.30, and then our next panel will start. Thank you very much. Let's hear it for our panel. Terrific job. Produced by Duke University. Online at duke.edu.